Hey, Magnus. Hello. How are you doing? Very well, and you? Oh, yeah. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm Keith Fox, CEO of Fighting Global in our New York City office, and I am delighted to welcome you to our third Fighting Preview, which is our series which features our authors in conversations with their editors. Today, we're welcoming Magnus Nilsson, among the world's greatest and most creative chefs who will be joining us to celebrate, which is now his fifth book with Biden. We first published Fabican in 2012, followed by the Nordic Cookbook, the Nordic Baking Book, and your stunning book of photography. We've sold over a quarter of a million books, making Magnus one of our best-selling Biden authors. Fabican, 4,015 Days, Beginning to End, shares the complete Fabican story. Candid, insightful, thought-provoking, it's an ode to an extraordinary restaurant and a remarkable journey. I had the pleasure of dining there, and this is the first fighting, fighting preview that I started off starving after seeing the images. I can't wait to hear more. Magnus is going to be joined in conversation with Biden's publisher, Amelia Tarani, for an exclusive preview of the book, which will publish worldwide on November 11th. So for those of you that are joining us for the first time, um, Amelia and Magnus are gonna be talking for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then Magnus will respond to your questions. Uh, to submit a question, just use your chat function that's on your screen. Thanks again for joining us for this Biden preview. You're here today because you're some of our most valued customers, retailers, partners, authors, and friends. Uh, please stay tuned for upcoming conversations with New York super florist, Putnam and Putnam, and the iconic Diane von Furstenberg. So enjoy the day. Over to Amelia and Magnus. Thank you. Hi, Magnus. How are you doing? I'm very Glad good. Glad to see you. So let's talk about uh, this uh, new book. Uh, uh, since I got the book uh, fresh from the printer a couple of weeks ago, I have read it once again cover to cover. It's such a nice pleasure to read it from a physical book and not the PDF. And uh, I have to say that it's really a wonderful book to read and to look at. It's full of recipes, stories, stunning images of uh, the food, the dishes, the people, the restaurant, and the incredible landscape. The book opens with uh, a, an essay called Why Would Anyone Write a Book About a Closed Restaurant and Who Would Want to Read It? Can you tell us why <laughs> and when you decided to write this book? I mean, uh, I think that, you know, that was the, the question that I asked myself in the end uh, when we, you and I actually began talking about this book as something that could be... Uh, a possibility and I, I remember you and I we uh, we sat uh, in a restaurant somewhere in London and I told you that I was going to close Pavikian and um, it was perhaps uh, two years before we actually closed something like that because it was a, a, a decision that took a while to kind of put in place and, uh, uh, and you asked me if I wanted to write the book and uh, I actually said that like, why would anyone want to write a book about a restaurant that's closed and, and who was, who, who's going to read it? Uh, and, you know, that was sort of the basis of the, that conversation, the first conversation we had about this book. And, uh, and the, the reason why I wanted to do it in the end is that it's actually twofold. Like, part of it is that I felt that there were a, a few things that I wanted to have said uh, about Fabrican uh, without the the sort of filtering of other media and uh, some of those things you know would have been difficult to communicate when the restaurant was still open and then the other part of it is that I mean, Fabian was a huge part of my life for 12 years and I've come to realize that it was also a really big part of a lot of other people's life uh, and, and not only those people working there uh, the people that provided produce to Fabian but also uh, a large group of customers who came there and uh, as it turns out a lot of them actually liked what we did and it uh, made their life nicer and uh, that's one of the reasons why I want to write the book. 
So this is the fifth book uh, that uh, we have done together. We published, as, as Keith said, we published the first uh, Favikin book in 2012, when uh, the restaurant has been running uh, for just a few years. Yeah. How much has uh, Favikin changed when it closed in December 2019? And uh, how different is this book uh, from the first one? I mean, I think as if, you, if we start with the restaurant, I mean, the, one of the few things that uh, were the same was that I was still there. Uh, and the place was still the same place, but aside of that, many, many things have changed, you know. And I think that that's uh, the way things are in a, in a successful project that someone cares about, is that, you know, it is allowed to change and it is allowed to evolve. Um, and when, when it comes to the books, I actually think it's very interesting because the first book uh, that came up in 2012, I mean, I it was commissioned then, I guess, in late 2010, perhaps. So it was very early. I came there, I started the restaurant in 2008. So that book was almost a story about the restaurant that didn't quite exist yet. I mean, a good part of what I wrote about in that book was the way I wanted it to become more than the way it had been back then in 2010 and 2011 when the book was written. And you, so you, you knew it all happened. Yeah, so you could say that like the, the, the first one is about the, a restaurant that barely existed and the last one is about the restaurant that doesn't exist anymore. And between the two, I think you can uh, <laughs> you get the whole story in there from the, the dream of what could potentially be to the reality of what was and the, the things that I mean, I learned from these 12 years and uh, some reflections about not just the restaurant, but also how the world kind of evolved during those 12 years and uh, especially the world of hospitality and restaurants. Yeah, as I said before, uh, the book is a very fascinating uh, reading. Uh, there are recipes. Uh, the recipes, of course, has ingredients and method, but also they have very interesting and extensive end notes that put uh, the recipes in the context of the restaurant uh, give specific tips about uh, techniques uh, or ingredients, uh, describe the dish with very useful details, or even explain why at a certain time uh, you decided to took that specific dish out of the menu, even if it was still delicious and very popular. How did you come up uh, with uh, this text uh, and what's the purpose of that? I mean, I think that, so, I mean, when we decided on making the book, the very first, like, when we sat down and decided what this book was going to be, uh, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but we decided that the book was not going to have any recipes, that it was just going to be a book of stories from Fabian and uh, from the life that I've had during these 12 years, you know, and photos, of course. But then, gradually, as I started producing the material for this, it kind of, I realized that uh, not including the a record of the dishes and the recipes is actually, it would have been like a, a huge missed opportunity to tell other kinds of stories that need the kind of, they need the structure of those recipes to make sense, you know, to help those stories become something more interesting than just plain text. Uh, and I mean, in the end, the, the, the book contains a, a list of uh, every single dish ever served at Favikin. And I think it's the 100, 100 with recipes. Yeah, yeah it's about 100 re complete recipes. Yes. Yeah, so it's like about 100 of the, of the sort of more like the more defining dishes and the more important dishes from my perspective, which doesn't actually mean that it's the most important dishes from everyone else's perspective. <laughs> um, but it is like the bulk of the recipes are exactly taken from the restaurant. They're not adapted, they're not changed. Nothing has been done to them. They've just been put in the book essentially to kind of um, make those little narrative introductions make sense really. Yeah, I think that's what is fascinating is that because the recipes are in chronological order, uh, you practically get the story of Favikin through the dishes and through the recipes. So yeah. the narrative is very much related to the recipes, uh, but uh, you, what you really get out of it is uh, what happens in uh, during this, uh, this period. The other elements of the book is that intersperse uh, with the recipes, there are essays uh, that talk about uh, 
creativity, sustainability, pleasure, family, and much more. So how, how did you come up with, uh, with all these topics? <laughs> I mean, I think that's uh, maybe one of the one of the great things with uh, having written many books with the same publisher is that you know I, I kind of write about what I want, as you know, um, and uh, that's what this is as well. This is uh, you know the, the recipes, as you say, they're in chronological order and they make up like the backbone of the book. They have dictated in a way like the structure from day one to the last day, but. All of those short stories, whether they are introduction to recipes or if they are completely uh, standalone narrative stories, that's just stuff that I felt like I wanted to write about. And um, there is no reason that fits for all of them why they're in the book, but they're all there for some specific reason. Um, and as I said in the in the very early bit of this chat, that I mean, I wanted to. Uh, explain how I felt about this restaurant uh, myself once and for all so that that's in record uh, and there's also a few recipes that touches on things that are just from a purely um, like practical perspective of running a restaurant like that very difficult to talk about when you're still running the restaurant but when you're not running the restaurant anymore you can talk about them as much as you want. So. Well, in particular, I, I am personally fascinated by your idea of uh, craft uh, over innovation. Can you talk about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is like something that I thought a lot about over the years, you know, and it's like, uh, I actually, I read this, and this is like, I guess there are probably not so many Swedes on today, but there was an article in a Swedish newspaper not that long ago uh, about the musical artist, Swedish musical artist, who put out a record in 1989 that was like such a huge success in Sweden, in Swedish. And uh, then everyone kept asking him year after year, like, when's the next record coming out? When, when are you going to do this again? And 10 years later, he accepted one interview. And uh, when he was asked the same question again, he said that, you know, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it much and I haven't really had time because I've been so busy watching television and applying for jobs. And I think that that's like such an interesting way of thinking of it because if you're a, a person that has been gifted with a, a, some amount of creative drive, uh, today uh, in hospitality and in many other creative fields, it's almost as, as if that kind of um, uh, skill alone uh, obliges you to a constant stream of delivery. That just having to, you know, been successfully creative once, it means that you are supposed to continue delivering the same type of creative content. And that's not how it works because you can't choose to uh, have right, creative ideas. You can choose to do many, many other things, but that you can't choose. And it's something that I very early on realized that this is not, I mean, the way that a lot of restaurants today try to deal with this, this sort of urge to from like a general public and from media to find new things uh, it's not sustainable and it's not particularly good either because what you end up having is rather like regurgitated uh, content from other places that isn't really truly the result of a personal creative process you know um, it might be perceived as such which is fine, you know, and it's great. I mean, if it makes the customers and, uh, and general public very happy and it's perceived as new content, that's okay. And it doesn't have to be a bad experience. But for a creative person, I mean, that's like death, you know, because that's really not what makes you excited. Uh, and I realized very early on that I'm like, at, at, at best, I'm moderately creative. Uh, and I happen to be very good at creating the circumstances for those truly creative ideas that I have that are very few to actually become something. That's like my great strength. Uh, and for me to try to, you know, churn out more creativity than uh, I naturally do, it doesn't work. And very easily, very early on, I just got much more interested in craft because craft is ever evolving. Uh, you know, there are so many dimensions of uh, repetitiveness it's a fantastic thing, really. You know, uh, when you do something many, 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 many times over, you pass that sort of border. Uh, when something becomes mundane, you start to see new dimensions. And to me, that's like just 
so much more interesting. And I know that that's like not what um, most people that are into like writing about restaurants like Favik or maybe even visiting them, that's not what they want to hear. But uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's the way I function. And I, I talk a lot about that in the book. Yeah, yeah. No, there is a lot about that in, uh, in the book. Uh, there are some similarity between haute couture and haute cuisine uh, that's uh, put uh, the uh, gastronomy into a different perspective that is uh, fascinating and very interesting. Yeah, Are there more um, topical? <laughs> no, go on. Sorry. And I think that's actually like super important because that's also this this idea that uh, a lot of these sort of the most ambitious restaurants in the world today they're kind of run the same way, um, and uh, and that I think that that way you know that doesn't mean that they're all the same, but the fact that they share so much uh, in the process and like the way that they're run from an infrastructure perspective, it also means that they become more similar. To each other, and I think that's personally, I think it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit of a pity, and it's a, bit, it's a, it's a lost opportunity for a, a much more diverse um, expression between restaurants. Yeah. So I was saying uh, on on a more topical subject, uh, um, you write in the book, and this is the question I wanted to ask you: Do you really feel it is impossible nowadays for a restaurant, a high-end restaurant, to be really sustainable? Uh, yeah, I think it's like, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's, it's not so much, actually, like, the, the way that I see that is that, you know, this is something that I thought a lot about, because, I mean, running a place like Fabric, and it's, a, it's an incredibly resource-intensive business, you know, um, and I think that it's a, this day and age when there's so much discussions about sustainability, it, like, it irritates me quite a bit that uh, a lot of people, you know, in the position that I was in, uh, they step forward and they claim that they are something they're not. And I think that it's very important to remember that pretty much all restaurants, and especially restaurants like Favik and at the very top end, at the, the, the highest ambition, uh, level of ambition, um, there is something that you're not supposed to do very often. <laughs> There's something that you're supposed to do, do like once in a while, you know, when you want to have a really good time or when you want to celebrate, celebrate something. Uh, which means that it's acceptable that they aren't sustainable in the true sense of the word. Because sustainable, it really means that it needs to be perpetually possible to, uh, you know, continue with something without it having any negative effects on its surrounding. And that's not the case with any of these restaurants. And I think that it's a, it's a bit of a pity that chefs like me then step up and say that, you know, we're super sustainable, we're doing this and this, we're recycling, we're doing these things and pulling the spotlight away from other <laughs> occurrences in the world of food or hospitality or wherever that actually is much, they're much more important, you know. Uh, and I also want to say that that's not an excuse to not be better because that's, that's a different thing. And we all have to be better and we have to be careful with the use of our resources, but we shouldn't just keep saying stuff that isn't true. And I mean, I, if, if I could just, count, which I can't, all of the times that I have been offered some sustainability award by someone, like by sometimes very, very well-known like guides and uh, media and um, foundations and stuff like that. Uh, you know, just, I, I guess because we had like that kind of uh, countryside cheek style with like a bar, you know, and we sourced from the land around Faviken. Uh, which has nothing to do with the fact that we are sustainable or not. We were a very unsustainable restaurant from an environmental perspective with people traveling in from all over the world with, you know, 40 staff cooking dinner for 24 guests uh, with uh, uh, kilos and kilos of produce being used, you know, only to create the most extreme uh, sort of um, expression of culture and pleasure. For a diner, and and I just want to say that I don't think that's wrong, but I think it needs to be like handled respectfully and in the right way. You know, it could be like you know we if we had like a sustainability currency in the same way as we have money. You know, you have to save up. You have a thousand dollars to spend, and you have a thousand in a year, and you have a thousand sustainability dollars to spend in a year. And if you burn them all in the at Fabric, and then you can't do any of that stuff anymore. Then you have to cook in your house. You have to cook like really nice vegetable food for the rest of the year in your home. In one pot, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So 
um, there are so many things in this book. It's, it's really inspiring. Uh, what do you hope readers will come away with after reading the book? I mean, I, I hope that they uh, get a sense of what Favik was and what, what it became and also why it had to go away. I, I have to say that it's, for me, it was a little bit more than that, uh, uh, meaning that uh, I think that uh, the topic that you touch on, uh, uh, like creativity, the family, and all the other subjects in the book, uh, they are really something that start uh, from Favikan, but that then go a little bit more far away. And I have to say that for me, this book is not only for people interested in food or in gastronomy, but it's more in general about uh, creativity, about craft, uh, and about really being inspired and having a project that is uh, a live project, and then it becomes something else. So for me, it's really something bigger than the, the, the story of, of Fabrican. Uh, going back to uh, the restaurant world, uh, um, the hospitality industry, as you know, has been hit incredibly hard uh, by, by the pandemic. Uh, how do you hope restaurants uh, change for the better? I mean, uh, I think that's difficult to say anything about, really. And I mean, I think the only thing that uh, we can see at this stage is that there's going to be a lot of restaurants that are not going to reopen. And that's, of course, very sad um, for all the people that rely on those businesses for their livelihood and also for the people that went to these businesses for, uh, you know, eating and for their pleasure. But I also do think that if we've already established that that's happening uh, and it's going to happen and different countries deal with this in different ways, uh, different, you know, with the different levels of success as well, but if we already uh, established that a lot of restaurants are not going to you know are not going to open again, I think that we do we, we should also like remember that that's also an opportunity for new things to come. Uh, and I mean, people sometimes say that uh, all change is good, and I'm not so certain that I agree with that. But I I, I would be uh, you know happy to say though that I do believe that there is no change that doesn't bring anything good with it. And I think in this case, maybe this is a possibility for uh, a new bunch of people that weren't able to uh, open places to, in the next few years, do so again. Because I don't buy into the idea that people are not going to go to restaurants anymore. I mean, that's something that's discussed, and I think that that's wrong. Uh, people are going to want to eat out also in the future. People are going to want to have a good time also in the future. And we just have to get through this uh, terrible time in the best possible way or in the least bad way possible and um, and then you know start rebuilding again and you know i look forward to uh um all of the new restaurants that are going to come in the future before going to the uh questions from uh, the audience uh, i have my last question uh, that is the one that i think everyone wants to know why Falcon had to close really which is by the way the title of uh, one of the essays in the book, uh, and uh, what's next? Yeah, I mean, so Fabrican had to close because it was done, uh, and uh, I didn't want to do it anymore. It was, uh, and, and you know, it sounds terrible to say that now, when a lot of restaurants have had to close, even though they wanted to stay open, and even though during normal circumstances they uh, were doing perfectly fine as businesses. But at the same time, I also feel incredibly grateful that um, I was sort of given the privilege to decide myself when Fabrican was done, when I had achieved what I wanted there um, and when I wanted to close it and how I wanted to close it. And it became very apparent to me uh, that I couldn't run it anymore because like that, the, the passion that you need to like, run a place like that in an honest way towards all of the people traveling there, paying so much money to eat there, it wasn't there anymore. Uh, and I, I actually, for like, for practical reasons, I sort of told myself that I needed to run it for a few more years than I did in the end. And I really tried, like the plan was to close it in 2023. That was like the initial plan when I sort of realized that this needs to happen. Um, and uh, I just couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't sort of make myself uh, go to work and uh, pretend and like, 
playing acts for uh, this team that worked there and were amazing every day, uh, pouring their energy into an experience that all these people traveled in for and you know used so much of their time and resources to get access to. Um, and I just couldn't do that when I when I knew that I didn't care about it anymore in that sense, you know. Um, and that was the reason why I had to close. And and as for what's next, I mean. Uh, I, I do two things now. Uh, I mean, uh, I work, or three things actually. <laughs> I mean, I have uh, our orchard in South Sweden where we grow apples and pears. Uh, and that sort of takes up some of the time, but it's not what I do on a day to day basis. And then the other thing that I do is that I work uh, with the MAD Foundation in Copenhagen, the, the, the foundation that Renee started 11 years ago that has been running, running MAD Symposium but that's now also uh, developing a school, uh, a project which I'm heading up. And then I also work with another foundation in Sweden, it's called the Kurt Bergfors Foundation, um, which essentially was founded just one year ago and has uh, 500 million krona to spend over the next 10 years on things that will you know, shift our um, constant deterioration of the environment. Uh, so I'm also working with that to finding homes for that money that, you know, can make an impact. Um, and then if there's going to be another restaurant, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any, you know, I, I didn't close Fabikin because I hate running restaurants now. <laughs> uh, but I closed it because I was done with that restaurant. And I don't, you know, I don't feel today that I want to start a new restaurant. but. You know, if I ever wake up in the morning and feel as passionately about that as I used to do for Famicom, then uh, I won't hesitate for a second and I will do something again. We will all wait to see it. <laughs> so we have now some questions from the audience. Josh from the UK. Hey Magnus, it was a pleasure to dine with you. Looking forward to reading your book and learning more. I'd love to know if you have kept up with photography. What have you been shooting? Uh, I haven't, or I have. I, mean, uh, I, I should. I, I, uh, I wish that I could say that I had photographed more, but I photographed so much for uh, the two Nordic books. I mean, that was like, I mean, was maybe four or five years of like from research first research phase until the last publication of the second book. Uh, and uh, after that, I, you know, I didn't. I haven't really felt as much for photography as I did. In a period um, and I think that it will come back but it's like one of those things it comes and goes for me and it's not my job uh, it's just something that I enjoy doing and you know have found uses for uh, in different projects. In the project. Yeah and then I think that it's like yeah it, it, it's really like I mean I'm taking the cameras out and I like clean them up and then I'm going to take them with me when I go somewhere or do something and then I always forget them and that's usually a sign that I don't really want to do it so <laughs> but I will find them. Yeah, we have Paul from Ireland. Magnus, how is the juice project coming on? The juice? Um, <laughs> I mean, I make, we make some apple juice uh, for the orchard. We have this little farm stand, uh, you know, where people put uh, coins in a jar and take uh, some juice with them. Uh, and it's going well. I mean, it's, it's a tasty juice. <laughs> delicious. It's really delicious. Andrew from the US. How do you think uh, you and Fabi can influence other chefs uh, and other restaurants? I mean, that's, it's very difficult to answer. Uh, I think that's best answered by other people, actually. But if I, I can say that I hope that I influence people uh, in such a way that they really care about what I think is the core value of a restaurant, that you know, they respect for the fact that people go there to have a good time. Kieran from the UK. Hi, Magnus. Theoretically, if you were to open any kind of eating space again in the post-pandemic world, what would it be? Theoretically, um, I don't know. Yeah. I, think, I don't know. I, you know, the, the, the thing with which is sometimes when I think back of like the, the, the past uh, almost twenty years where I've been cooking. Um, I realized that I've only ever really done one kind of thing. I've only even really worked in one kind of restaurant, and it's the kind of restaurant that Fabi can watch. So that's really all I know. 
uh, I don't know how to run another kind of business. And I think that if I were to ever open another restaurant, it would be something um, that would function in a similar way to Fabrican, but that would be more in tune with the, the sort of reality there and then, whatever that might be. We have Sophie from Amsterdam. What's the impact of social media on the dining, on the dining experience today, do you think? Terrible. <laughs> it's actually, it's like, it's not just in the dining scene. I think that's like, I mean, I use social media uh, as well. Uh, I'm not particularly great at it. Uh, I'm sure there are a few people who follow me on Instagram to see that I post like once every three months or something on average. But so I think with social media, uh, we're going to learn to, we're going to have to learn how to use that in a more clever way. And I think that we will, as with many things. But currently, we've really destroyed one of the most fundamental uh, human pleasures for ourselves. We've destroyed it for ourselves. And that's like to have your mind blown, you know? Uh, because there's so little information about things that isn't like fed to you today. Uh, uh, and I think about that a lot with people going to restaurants like Fabric and you know that you know, most of them already know what the dishes are going to look like, they know what the chef's voice is going to sound like, they uh, know what uh, a thousand other people have thought about those dishes and that meal before. And I, I, I do think that that's like, a, it's a bit of a pity that we, uh, you know, deprive ourselves of that sort of, uh, sort of fantastic thing of like really being mind blown by something you haven't experienced. Yeah, I remember how happy you were when uh, people would just stop eating to take photos uh, during your menu. Yeah, so I mean, they think that uh, it's like, becoming more yeah. of a of a just not not experiencing, but. Uh, it's difficult to say anything about. I mean, I do the same thing. I also take photos of my food, and it's dumb. You know, I know that, but I still do it. And I think that we just have to learn how to be better at those things and, like, actually existing in the moment and having experiences rather than, uh, you know, uh, pointlessly trying to share the experiences that we're not having because we're so busy documenting them with other people. <laughs> Um, Pasha from Indonesia, just curious, do you think the eating space of Fabican as a relation to how people eat their food? Yeah, I think like, you know, if you look at all of the, uh, all of the different parts that make a restaurant up, I mean, uh, the space and its location geographically, it's a huge part of that. And I definitely think that that influences you know, not perhaps how people eat it, but how could people perceive the food and the rest of the experience for sure. Yeah, it was also interesting in uh, in Pavican that uh, you had first uh, the 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 small bites and the drinks uh, on on the ground floor, and then you were going upstairs. So it was really part uh, of of the experience, and it was very very interesting to experience the difference uh, the different spaces. Um, Amy, hi Magnus, what is your family cooking and sharing during this pandemic times? What are we cooking? I mean, yeah. uh, what is your family cooking and sharing during this pandemic times? Yeah, we're, uh, we're cooking the same stuff as we always do, but uh, perhaps um, at the moment we're cooking a bit more vegetables because we, uh, I mean, so the, the orchard where we live in the summer and where we're going to move permanently to uh, at the um, end of the school year, this school year, so it's like June 21. Uh, we also have like put up a massive vegetable garden there because that's like it's one of my big hobbies and pleasures in life is to garden. Um, it's been for many, many years. Uh, so this year, I mean, we harvested I think maybe 3,000 kilos of vegetables in total. Uh, and some of it has been put in the farm stand and you know, whatnot, yeah. but uh, a lot of it's also been eaten by us during the summer and like put in storage for the winter. So it's a lot of cooking with that at the moment. Yeah, also, as you say in the book, you've been cooking for your family forever. Yeah. So it's not only the, during the pandemic, you are the one who cooks in, in the family. So nothing yeah, where, we, where we live, you can't go out for dinner either. I mean, that's something to remember that <laughs> where, where my house is, there are no restaurants. So um, we, we eat all of our meals uh, at home if we're not traveling somewhere. Uh, Nick, uh, was there an ingredient that you have never worked with uh, and wish that you had? 
Hmm. Not really, I think. I mean, uh, I'm up for cooking with anything. I, I, you know, as long as it's like great quality and provided to you by someone who cares about stuff, uh, it usually makes me happy to cook with it. Uh, but I don't have any uh, like deep, unfulfilled desires of uh, various ingredients to cook with. No, I don't think so. Oh, actually, uh... I just came up with one. Sorry. Uh, oh. So there's this thing that's called ambergris. And I'm not going to go into details on what that is because it's going to be way too lengthy. But people can Google it if they don't know already what it is. Uh, and that I wanted to cook with. And I had like some coastal forager looking for it along the Norwegian coastline for years. And we never, we never got it. Maybe uh, Dylan. Hello, Magnus. Thank you for being here. Could you please expand upon the mad school which you will be heading up? Yeah. Um, no, so I mean, uh, the Mad Academy is essentially the kind of new development of Mad um, Foundation, and the whole point is to create circumstances for positive change through the world of hospitality and food. And um, we're developing the school at the moment, and it's uh, funded the half, uh, fifty percent by the Danish government and 50% uh, via private donations uh, from people who also believe in the power of hospitality to kind of actually uh, create change. And what we're doing is that we've identified uh, where we think that we can make the most difference uh, through people in hospitality. And we figured out that if we give people who are kind of at the very senior level as craftspeople, and perhaps about to transition into management, junior management, or maybe even owning and running their own place a couple of years down the line. If we're able to equip them with some pretty basic information and tools um, and a bit of inspiration to take action, we're going to be able to avoid like a lot of, pre like a lot of problems that we have in hospitality, uh, whether it's uh, in leadership or business or when it comes to environment and sustainability, which is the two programs that we run. Um, so that's really the whole idea with what we do. And we, uh, when we're fully up and running, which will be about in one year, we'll have around 800 students a year. Nice. Chef, greetings from George Brown Chef School in Toronto. Hello. How did Shell hold the farmers who supported you at Favican survive with the restaurant being closed? And how has Favican influenced the landscape of the region's restaurant? Yeah, I, I know that like some of the some of our suppliers, we were like by far their biggest customer, um, and naturally, I mean that that has a big impact on uh, someone's business. But I've also seen that most of the people that we kind of uh, I wouldn't say discovered, but most of the people that we started working with uh, and that we gave like significant business they've also developed their own businesses a lot uh, and they're just like doing so well at the moment um trading with other restaurants you know um so i, I think that you know it was actually one, like one of my biggest worries when i decided to close like one of the first things that i started to think about because i, I wasn't particularly worried about the staff i mean uh restaurant people are uh famously agile in finding new jobs and doing other yeah. things and you know be creative with their time but it was actually like uh, some of these suppliers where i knew that maybe we made up you know 50 percent of their total sales or something um but you know gladly none of them uh seem to uh, uh have suffered much for us closing then obviously some of them are struggling anyways with the pandemic but uh you know they're all there and we're still in touch so right right um, Vanessa, what were some of your favorite memories of Fabican? I mean, if, if I look at sort of, I, if you start with that, I don't miss. I don't miss working in the evenings. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't miss having like all of the um, uh, admin that comes with running uh, a business that has 43 employees. Um, but then pretty much all of the rest of it, I actually do miss. I don't think I can pick any favorite moments like that or memories, you know, it's like, I, I miss having, 
guests in restaurants uh, and I miss, uh, you know, part of my team, like a big part of my team, like a lot of people that I worked with for seven, eight, uh, some of them almost 10 years, uh, very closely. Uh, and obviously to not see those people every single day, uh, it's, a, it's a big adjustment. Well, I have to say that uh, the last night at Fabrica was pretty epic. So I think that there were very, very good memories about uh, that wonderful night in which practically everybody who had ever worked at Fabrica spent uh, a last night uh, with uh, a lot of friends and family. Yeah, there was, it was actually uh, really, I mean, uh, it was really a very beautiful kind of end to it. And, I mean, what we did was essentially that we invited every single person that had ever been employed in the restaurant to come back uh, for uh, the closing party. And that was the only people um, who were invited with the exception of, you know, a few of our most regular customers and a few people that for other reasons meant a lot to me or to the restaurant, like Emilia, for example. Um, and almost everyone come and came. I mean, there was the... Uh, a small handful of people who had other obligations or who couldn't travel or for other reasons couldn't come. But yeah, I think I mean, we were 250 or 270 people, I think. Um, and uh, I think there were seven people that couldn't make it in the end out of everyone that ever worked there. So it's pretty cool. It was, it was. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Magnus. Uh, first of all, for I've written uh, this wonderful book, uh, it's uh, really incredible. You are a very gifted uh, writer. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's always a pleasure to work uh, and to talk to you. Thank you, Emilia. Likewise. And Magnus, um, in the spirit of staying in the moment, we did not photograph you. We were, and it was a very special moment. I think that's. Um, and I just wanted to end by, by saying one thing, which is part of what makes Biden, I believe, so extraordinary is how we collaborate. And you and Amelia have had this long-term, creative, inspiring relationship that although you, it's not the same as being at Favicon, I'm um, seeing the imagery that you photographed and hearing your voice and seeing how the two of you created something so special in a printed book format uh, really touches me and I think touches all of us. And, and it's one of the reasons uh, that you're such a, uh, an artist and someone who's truly extraordinary to work with. So thank you to both of you. Um, I got to ask one question. I was dying a million for you to ask this. And it came up a couple times. Um, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration in, the, in, the, um, in that theory of how you collaborate, how you collaborated on the cover? For us? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, I'm... Uh, I think that by now, famously impossible with the covers. Uh, I rarely like them. And uh, I mean, uh, the first cover of the first book, I hated when it was first. <laughs> uh, exactly. And, uh, and then I kind of, it grew on me and I grew to read about it. And then uh, the second uh, cover that we made for the Nordic cookbook, I truly hated when it was presented. <laughs> And that one I think about the whole process. And then Emilia essentially told me that you just have to trust me now. You know, this is like, this one is going to work. This is a great cover. Uh, and after that, I mean, that one really turned out that she was completely right. And after that, I've had, you know, a lot more trust, I think. And the funny thing with this book, this book is the first cover that I really loved, like from the first presentation. Um, and I'm very happy that everyone else was on board as well, since I truly hated all the other proposals. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the hating of certain covers. It's, and this, it's actually the, the story of our working relationship, because when I asked him to do the Nordic cookbook, he thought it was the worst idea ever. So, and then he got around. Yeah. So, Okay. Well, we're very proud to publish you. Um, there were questions about your next book. We will let you figure out what that is. But I'm going to thank you for your leadership of the culinary program. Thank you for bringing Magnus to us. Magnus, thank you for being such a talent. Uh, this has by far been the most global of our Biden preview. And we look forward to celebrating uh, this book and the launch and, and future books with you. You're a true artist and star. And we're very proud to have you on our list. So thanks, everyone. Thank uh, you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.